Uh, I want to say welcome to Bird's Books for our third Battle of the Books. For those of you who are out of our area, my name is Alice Hutchinson and I am the owner of Bird's Books. Ours is a small eight-year-old family-owned independent bookstore in downtown Bethel, Connecticut. Right now we're doing mostly online ordering and curbside pickup and shipping, but have just started to open to three patrons at a time or one family grouping. If you want to know more, please visit our website at birdsbooks.com. We first hosted the Battle of the Books live in the bookstore before an audience. Jim Mustick continued the enthusiasm for his book, 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, by facilitating this event where five people presented a book to a crowd and the audience chooses the book they would most like to read. And this is our third battle. In this virtual environment, we both decided that it could still work and could include folks from all over the country, which enriches our offering. Each of you will get an email tomorrow that includes information on all five books presented tonight, the link to Jim's website, The Company of Books, and a link to the video from tonight's battle. So here's the way tonight will go. I'm going to introduce Jim, and then <laughs> Jim will speak and introduce each of the five presenters in turn. Each of those five presenters will get four minutes to pitch their book as the book we should read. Jim's wife, Margot, will time the presenters. At the end of the presentations, we vote. The winner of the battle gets assigned copies of copy of a thousand books to read before you die, donated by the author. The runner up is invited to pitch a book at the next battle of the books. We ask that you please remain muted tonight. For those of you unfamiliar to Zoom, there's a toolbar at the bottom of your screen. In it, you will see an icon labeled chat. If you click on that, you'll see an area open to the right of your screen. You may type a question, cheer your friend, or make a comment on the book as the presenter speaks. My son, Stephen, will silence the phones <laughs> and will watch the chat for any questions that we may have time for at the end of the evening. So now I'd like to introduce James Mustick. James Mustick began his career in bookselling at an independent bookstore in Briarcliff Manor, New York in the early <clears throat> 1980s. In 1986, he co-founded the acclaimed book catalog, A Common Reader, and was for two decades its guiding force. He subsequently, subsequently has worked as an editorial and product development executive in the publishing industry. He lives with his wife, Margot, in Connecticut. Jim, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Alice. It's nice to be here tonight. It's always a little unnerving to be addressing a group of people remotely. But in some ways, it's also a nice <coughs> metaphor for the way the company of books can nourish, can nourish solitude and conversation. I spent a long time writing this thousand page book called 1000 Books to Read Before You Die. Its subtitle supplied by the publisher is a life changing list. And while the hyphenated adjective uh, might seem overly dramatic, it does speak to a kind of faith at the core of my work as a bookseller over the past 40 years. And I bring it up now to, su to salute our host, Alice Hutchinson, who embodies as well as anyone I know, the steadfast sense of mission that animates devoted booksellers. This sense of vocation was best summed up by Roger Mifflin, who was a protagonist in Christopher Morley's novel, The Haunted Bookshop, who said that the book selling vocation is to spread good books about, to sow them on fertile minds, and to propagate understanding and a carefulness of life and beauty. I know how hard it is to do this work in good times, and to continue to do it during a pandemic requires courage, as well as culture and commercial savvy. So thank you, Alice. Well, it's a pleasure you. to be here, so to speak, for our third battle of the books with Bird's Books and our first virtual one. Let me tell you quickly how these battles of the book came about. As I, spent, as I said, I spent a long time writing my book, 
And when it was finally published in the fall of 2018, my wife Margo and I traveled around the country talking about it in bookstores and libraries and other venues. venues. And having spent 14 years writing it, I quickly realized that I was going to spend the next 14 years having people tell me what I got wrong, what I left out, what I should have included, uh, and so on. Uh, and I learned this because the best part of all of our events were the Q&As afterwards with the audience. And it delivered exactly the kind of exchanges I was hoping to provoke. I'm going to read just a few sentences from the introduction to the book to explain what I mean. A thousand books to read before you die is neither comprehensive nor authoritative, nor is it meant to be. It's meant to be an invitation to a conversation, even a merry argument about the books and authors that are missing, as well as the books and authors included. Because the question of what to read next is the best prelude to even more important ones, like who to be and how to live. Those merry arguments ha happened after my book talk in nearly every venue we visited. And at one point, Margot had the inspired idea to make them their own event. Thus, the battle of the books were born, landing us in communities where local luminaries, such as we have tonight, could share their own favorite books with us and their neighbors. Which brings us to tonight's event, so let's get to it. We have five contestants doing battle this evening. Alyssa Altman, Pat Cosentino, Chris Durante, Heather Mead, and Rebecca Myers. I'm going to introduce them one by one in alphabetical order, and they will speak for four minutes about a book I left off my list of a thousand books that they think everybody should read. We'll signal them gently when they have 30 seconds left. Did we hear that bell? Just a ding. Yeah, can you, Margo, are you, Margo, are you on mute? No, I'm not. Okay, ding the bell. <laughs> That's what you're gonna hear with 30 seconds to go. And when you're done, you're gonna hear a more vehement bell ringing. Can we hear that one? Okay, you gotta get closer to your speaker there. Okay. Um, after all five have pitched their books, you can cast your vote. Up first is Elissa Altman. She's the author of the critically acclaimed books, Motherland, a memoir of love, loathing, and longing, Trafe, my life as an unorthodox outlaw, and Poor Man's Feast, a love story of comfort, desire, and the art of simple cooking. And she's also the author of the James Beard award-winning narrative blog of the same name. A columnist for the Washington Post and Lion's Roar, her work also appears in O oh, the Oprah Magazine, Tin House, The Rumpus, Lit Hub, The New York Times, The Guardian, and Krista Tippett's On Being. That's a very impressive resume. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Uh, Alyssa has appeared live on stage at the public with Wallace Shawn and widely on NPR. She was a finalist for the Frank McCourt Memoir Prize and for the 2020 Lambda Literary Award in Memoir. She lives in Newtown, Connecticut with her wife, book designer, Susan Turner. And the book she is going to tell us about tonight is Crossing to Safety by Wallace Stegner. There we go. Alyssa, it's all yours. Okay. What is there to say about a book that follows two gorgeous couples through 40 years of friendship, literary success, failure, jealousy, trips to Europe and Vermont, the ups and downs of academic jobs, parenthood, and contains absolutely not a hint of sex. Crossing to Safety is a book by a Pulitzer Prize winner, Wallace Stegner, that hinges on the very magnificence of the mundane, the things that make every single one of us human and that binds us to each other at a time of great division. There is no murder, nothing titillating, nothing extraordinary. Instead, this is a novel about the vagaries and universality of friendship wrapped around a core of dignity and intimacy, truth and kindness, loyalty, 
and the creation of a life of meaning and beauty. This is a quiet, stunning, lovely work of fiction, a classic for the ages. And Lord knows we need that now more than ever. Thank you very much. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> oh, well, that was very well said. And I'm, I'm just going to add something. I discovered as I was traveling around talking about the book, as I indicated before, learning what I got wrong is <laughs> that there are, uh, there is a whole underground army of people who love crossing to safety. Mm -hmm. And I found that out because I actually have a book by Wallace Stegner in my book, but it's another novel called Angle of Angle Repose. Angle of Repose, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in, I would say a good half of the venues we appeared in, somebody would stand up and say, no, 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 not Angle of Repose. <laughs> you should have chosen Crossing to Safety. So I'm glad that you uh, spoke about it so eloquently. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Uh, next up, Pat Cosentino. Dr. Cosentino currently resides in Bethel with her son, Vincent, and their dog, Dallas. She enjoys going to New York City to visit friends and see shows on Broadway. That seems like 100 years ago. Um, she is a big music fan, and her favorite is Bruce Springsteen. Pat enjoys the outdoors, both the country and the beach, appreciating the beauty and serenity of nature. Pat has been an educator for over 35 years. She is currently the superintendent of New Fair Fairfield Schools. She loves her job and has a passion for public education and students. She aspires to represent what is best about, the, about education and leads by example, putting the children she serves first. She understands the importance of practicing an attitude of gratitude. And the book she is going to talk about is Fascism, A Warning, by Madeline Albright. Pat, it's all yours. Bad start, there we go. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Alice, for including me. Um, I do have a special shirt on, so I wore <laughs> Yay. <laughs> the costume. So uh, I'm here to um, share a warning, okay? I'm pleased to introduce uh, the number one New York Times bestseller, Fascism, A Warning by Madeleine Albright. This book is a personal and urgent examination of fascism in the 21st century and how its legacy, legacy is shaping today's world. I think the warning part of the title is extremely important, especially what's going on now in our lives. We have to fight for our democracy and our country. In March 1939, German stormtroopers invaded Czechoslovakia, causing Madeline's family to go into hiding and move to London. After six years of reign of the Nazis and Hitler, her family moved back to Czechoslovakia, but then had to leave once it was under communist rule. Her family got to the United States and were welcomed as refugees, which is a nice twist on what's going on now. Uh, many members of her family were killed during the Holocaust, and that was the ultimate act of fascism. These events in her life deeply, deeply impact her work. Fascism feeds on social and economic grievances, including the belief that people over there are receiving better treatment than they deserve while I am not getting what I am owed. Sounds familiar. Fashion, Fascism comes around slowly, like pulling chicken feathers one at a time. Small aggressions go on and no one does anything. The aggressions continue and they get bigger and bolder and more dangerous. Fascism as a movement is a willingness to do whatever is necessary, including force and trampling on the rights of others to achieve victory and command obedience. This book reminds us of the fascists in the world, including Mussolini and Hitler. Secretary of State Albright writes about Putin and the way he controls military, media, communication. She explains what happens 
when someone dares not speak, dares to speak against him. And unfortunately, we see a lot of this in our country today. Albright is surprisingly fair to Trump and gives him the benefit of the doubt in some points. For example, she agrees, agrees that world leaders need to speak well of each other. Trump often does this, except that he speaks well of the leaders who are weakening democratic institutions and going after our allies. The job of international and world leadership is one that leaders never finish. Old dangers rarely go away and new dangers appear regularly. Trump does not have a handle on this important aspect of the presidency and the impact it's having on our reputation around the world is disgraceful. Trump has a dark view of the US. He states courts are biased, the FBI is corrupt, the press is fake news, and elections are rigged. His messages divide and demoralize us. So I share again a warning. We need leaders who can be trusted, who put the American people first, leaders who put the country over themselves. Trump does not do this. So once again, I remind you, you have been warned. Read this book and vote in November. Pat, thank you very much. Welcome. We're gonna move on to Chris Durante, who was the runner up in our previous battle at Bird's Book when we did it live with wine and cheese and uh, a great deal of conviviality. Chris is a frame maker, artist, educator, husband, and pretty good chef. His bolognese is legendary. That's the second time I've had to say that, so you're gonna have to invite me over to try it, okay? <laughs> At least in his own mind. 62 trips around the sun and he's learned that Pete Townsend was wrong. Getting old is okay and actually good when you learn to hit the pause button from time to time. The book he's gonna talk about tonight is 4th of July Creek, 4th of July Creek by Smith Henderson. Chris, all yours. Hello everybody, 4th of July Creek by Smith Henderson. Um, I just wanna, before I get into the meat of this, I uh, just wanna thank everybody for putting this together. This is a great event. And uh, you know, what's better than spending a bunch of time with people talking about books and uh, it's a good thing. So here it is, 4th of July Creek, Smith Henderson. The notion of the other has been weighing heavily on my mind of late. Where do we find the compassion, the empathy, the grace to deal with people, situations outside of our own bubble? I'm not gonna miss words. This is a brutal read not in the sense of gratuitous violence or anything like that, but more in its honesty and its insistence on holding a mirror up to us to reflect on our own inner workings. It's 1981, there's been a, an attempt to assassinate Ronald Reagan, Mount St. Helens has erupted, and a 14 year old feral boy wanders into a small Montana mining town. His name is Benjamin. Pete Snow, the local good guy social worker, follows him back into the wild and encounters the boy's father, Jeremiah Pearl. A crazy, violent, dangerous survivalist preparing for the end of times, maybe even trying to facilitate their beginning a little sooner than later. Pete's life is a mess. His wife has left him. His teenage daughter is missing. He drinks too much. And eventually the two men start to forge a trust of each other, both realizing that they are desperately trying to keep their families together, albeit by really different way means. And then the FBI gets involved and then all hell breaks loose. I like this book for a number of reasons. Uh, the characters are rich, they're very well researched, they're very real, they're not cartoons. Um, you won't see these characters on Netflix or anything like that. They're, they're 
they're brutal, they're real, they're honest. Um, the story never veers off into a cliche. It keeps you guessing every step of the way. Um, all the ancillary characters weave in and out and um, add to the narrative. It's like a great jazz record. Um, it bears up on repeated readings. I've read it three times. And each time I find a new, a new nuance, a new theme, a new riff that, um, that gives me a greater insight into what's going on in the book. Um, the book pulls no punches and it lands a lot of them. But when tenderness comes, it's warm and it's soothing. The main theme is two profoundly flawed men fighting hard to maintain their families and hold on to their, their life, albeit by drastically different means. Love of, of family is the common theme, is the glue that pulls them together. Love, basic, simple human love. I walked away from this book with a deep sense of understanding and a greater willingness to question my own responses when facing the other. Uh, ultimately, the two men become reflections of their own faults and are forced to confront the other that exists inside of each of them. The resolution is powerful, profound, surprising, and as gut-wrenching as it is cathartic. It is a cautionary tale set in an America before the internet, before cell phones, before 24-7 CNN. It could be now. It could be 100 years ago. It could be this second. We just have to be as honest and as open as this book is to be able to hear it and see it. I urge you to read this book. You will think a little differently when confronted with the other. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Well done and perfectly timed. Hey, well, you know, <laughs> I've been practicing. <laughs> Next up, uh, Heather Mead who based on her virtual background is coming to us from a galaxy far away with <laughs> originally from the Syracuse, New York area, Heather moved to Connecticut in 2007 <laughs> to try and find a job during the great recession. She now serves as technical project manager for Subway in Milford. What you should read from that, ha, huh, is that she is a giant nerd. Learning to read at age three will do that to you. She is always reading something and is open to any subject. Her curiosity knows no bounds. Having recently likened the predictive analysis of the food truck industry to the natural behaviors of social bees, you can imagine the slow blinks, her friends and coworkers suffer that endless curiosity pretty well. And she's gonna to talk to us tonight about a book called The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. Heather, take it away. And if we were there with glasses of wine, you were gonna have to, you'd have to explain to me the predictive analysis of the food truck industry and the social bees. So the next time we Very do Very joyously, I would do that. So next time, I got you. <laughs> Great, The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. Brilliant, thank you so much. I hope you're all prepared for something a little different. For sometimes, a book comes to you without warning. No announcements precede it, no paper notices on downtown posts and billboards, no mentions or advertisements in local newspapers. It's simply there, when yesterday it was not. And so begins Aaron Morgenstern's The Night Circus. I hereby invite you to read it. There you go, now you can see it. Appropriately, it opens at nightfall and closes at dawn. Why? Because realistically, this is the kind of book you might find yourself still reading at dawn. Our dream begins with the dramatic introduction of a talented young girl and two magicians, each skilled in their craft. One, a performer, uses his magic to charm a late 1800s era crowd. The other, an academic, believes such power should not be peddled publicly. To settle the matter, the two strike up an old bet. Each selects a student with the intent to work one against the other, but only one will win. What they shall win is unknown, but the swirling tale of love and betrayal against a rich backdrop of color and sound is unforgettable. Uh, what I love most about this story is that not only is it immediately and continually arresting, but it is a wine sipped slowly from multiple senses. Uh, if you're a reader like me in which you process books very visually, it's a trove of wonder for you. 
uh, striking sets that intimate plot through clever use of color, richly described people and places. And if you're a foodie, prepare to crave caramel corn and hot chocolate. Uh, <laughs> if you're not a visual reader <laughs> and instead you consume the shape of text as pure data, you too are invited to a symphony of prose delicately tuned so that it very nearly begs to be read aloud. Uh, if audiobooks are your pleasure, you're in a good place. For example, I'll extend you a little VIP ticket. You step into a bright open courtyard surrounded by striped tents. Curving pathways along the perimeter lead away from the courtyard, turning into unseen mysteries dotted with twinkling lights. There are vendors traversing the crowd around you, selling refreshments and oddities. A contortionist in a sparkling black costume twists on a platform nearby, bending her body into impossible shapes, all bathed in glowing light. The light emanates from a large bonfire in the center of the courtyard. As you walk closer, you can see that it sits in a wide black iron cauldron balanced on a number of clawed feet. Where the rim of a cauldron would be, it breaks into long strips of curling iron as though it has been melted and pulled apart like taffy. The curling iron continues up, weaving in and out amongst the other curls, giving it a cage-like effect. The flames are visible in the gaps between and rising slightly above. They're obscured only at the bottom, so it is impossible to tell what is burning, if it is wood or coal or something else entirely. The flames are not yellow or orange, but white as snow as they dance. Later in the book, I think Morgenstern speaks to us through a character saying, I think of myself not as a writer so much as someone who provides a gateway. I relay through words that they can read again and again, returning to the circus whenever they wish, regardless of time of day or physical location, transporting them at will. When put that way, it sounds rather like magic, doesn't it? It does. And it is. But now I suspect my time is up, and for you, the circus has arrived. The iron gates shudder and unlock, seemingly by their own volition. They swing outward, inviting you inside. The night circus is open. The battle is waged. Now you may choose. Perfect. Well done and well timed again. Thank you. Um, our last contestant, Rebecca Myers, comes to us from Atlanta. And she is Alice's sister. In her 72 years, Rebecca has lived in West Virginia, Connecticut, Washington, D.C., New York, Boston. St. Louis, Philadelphia, San Francisco, and finally for the past three decades in Atlanta. At various times and various places, she has owned a bookstore, worked several jobs in a family homeless shelter, edited a small magazine, run a thrift store, been a teacher, a choir director, an Orthodox priest's wife, a mother of two daughters, and a grandmother of three wonderful children. Somebody should write that novel. Currently a widow, she still leads a choir which cannot meet but sings virtually, is fortunate enough to live with one of her daughters and near the other, has great dogs to keep her walking and laughing, enjoys the Times crosswords, and tries not to buy back all the books she gave away when she moved into her new home last July. And she's going to talk to us about Amor Towles' novel, A Gentleman in Moscow. Heather? No, that may not Heather. Rebecca, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, now the screen has changed. I was looking at Heather before. Hi. Hello. Take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Alice and Stephen. Long live birds, books, and indie bookstores everywhere. Those of you who have read already Amor Tolls, A Gentleman in Moscow, know why I'm here to champion this book. To you, I can heartily recommend that you read it again. After enduring the past several months of isolation and uncertainty, I found even more to delight me, more to relate to, than when I first met Count Alexander Ilyich Grostov several years ago. As for those of you who have not had the pleasure, this is a story for the ages, but most pertinent right now, when we have all had our lives disrupted and face a future very different from what we have supposed it would be. We meet Count Rostov on the day that he is condemned by the Bolshevik Tribunal of 1922 
to spend the rest of his days under house arrest in the Hotel Metropole. Not in the elegant apartments he's lived in since 1918, but in a tiny garret room, which was once assigned to the servants of guests of the hotel. We witness his endeavors over the next 30 years to master his circumstances rather than be mastered by them. Towles manages by his elegant prose and by creating a character whom we embrace as a friend to make these years fly by. We are never bored, even as the action is limited in scope to the walls of the hotel. There is no limit to the scope of Count Rostov's mind and heart. The Count addresses himself with a wry observation of his own shortcomings. He avoids self-pity, realizing that wishing one's circumstances to be other than they are is the surest path to madness. He meets each new circumstance, each new challenge with wit, resourcefulness, humor, compassion, and courage. He greets every person with respect, no matter his or her station in life. There's one notable exception, a man whom he nicknames the Bishop, who seems to stand for all that is soul destroying in the new Soviet ideology, and who becomes a kind of foil for the Count through the second half of the novel. As life outside the Metropole becomes increasingly treacherous for all Russians, the Count is alternately delighted and dismayed by the impact of the changes on his friends. Through these changes, we witness the history of this bleak period of post-revolutionary Russia in very human terms. We first meet one of these friends, nine-year-old Kuliko uh, Nina Kulikova, early in the Count's adjustment to his new circumstances as a previous person as the new regime defines him. Their bond becomes a life-changing force which cycles back years after she has left the hotel to change his life again and give it new purpose. This cycling effect is an often repeated motif as his actions bear fruit well beyond the significance of what could be imagined at the time they were made. The Count strives to be, as he puts it, a man of purpose. He does not allow his confinement to a circumscribed life to daunt him in that quest. I have found it immensely inspiring to have his example before me as I try to come to terms with the trials and disappointments of this life. I intend to visit him again in time and I expect I will discover new, different insights as different aspects of his journey occur in my life. I hope you will discover this marvelous man for yourselves at the very least, you'll be entertained, but I suspect you will find a new friend, as I have, and perhaps a mentor in Count Alexander Ilyich Rostov. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Well, there are five wonderful books. Uh, thank you to all of our presenters, and let's have a big virtual round of applause for all of our <laughs> contestants. And now we're going to do uh, the voting. And um, Alice, you want to take it over? I'll come back and say a few words after this. But oh. here you see our five books. And, um, and we're what we're going to do is we have a poll that's going to be launched. And for each book, I have put the title and the person who presented. And now, you may start voting. You just choose. There we, oh my goodness. All right, we'll give everyone a few minutes to vote <laughs> and we will talk about our winner. We've only got a we've only got a few more. We got about thirteen more people to vote. Wow. <laughs> That's quick. <laughs> it's close, folks. Ooh. Choice, I will tell you Ooh. that. Tough choices. Fifty-four out of sixty-three. Come on, folks, vote up. <laughs> Fifty-four out of sixty-three. 
I know there's some tough decisions here. <coughs> but there's a couple here I've not read, so I'm really looking forward to reading them. Fifty-seven out of sixty-three. Come on, <laughs> ninety ninety-two percent voted. While we're waiting, Alice, I will share that I yes. made a themed cocktail for tonight's. Excellent. <laughs> oh, are you bribing people? Oh, oh, oh! I didn't. Oh. I'm not bribing. Oh no, no! I will share this recipe. Don't you worry. But it is a salted caramel corn martini. If you send they me the recipe, fun. I will include oh, I will. it in the, in the follow-up email tomorrow. Yeah. Absolutely. Just letting Absolutely. you know. Absolutely. Something oh, to look forward to. Excellent. We've got about five or ten more seconds, folks, so get your votes in. We just about ready? Everybody voted? You ready for me to reveal? Yes. yes, let's see. All right, that's the end. And I'm going to share the results. Wow. Very close. Very close. Whoa. That's Very pretty amazing. Close. Excellent. Chris, are you really the runner up again? <laughs> <laughs> always, always the bridesmaid. <laughs> Maybe third time is the charm. <laughs> Right? Excellent. Well, the winner is a gentleman in Moscow by Yay. a hair. So, congratulations coming to us from Atlanta. Although you're not our furthest uh, participant in the audience, I noticed someone from Anchorage, Alaska, oh, wow. and uh, Northern California as well. So we're reaching out across the country. Uh, but congratulations to Rebecca. Chris, you, you get you're you're on on deck again for our next version. <laughs> so keep reading. And let me just say a few words in closing, if if you'll bear with me for a while. Uh, one is as part of the book, and to continue this conversation, we've built a website at one thousand books to read dot com. That's the number is one zero 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 books to read dot com, and at the site, you'll find my list of a thousand books with excerpts from what I've written about them in the volume. You can comment upon my choices, but you can also add your own books to the list, just as people have done tonight. And everyone can see them. Every two weeks, I send out a newsletter every other Friday in which I talk about events like this, things that I'm reading and writing, uh, and also talk about the books that have been added on the site. So it's if you've enjoyed tonight, you'll enjoy the website. And if you go to the website, I encourage you to sign up for the newsletter because I think you'll like it. It's great. Um, in times like this, it's good to have good company of books and of readers. And I'm grateful to all of you who participated as contestants and joined the audience. I spoke earlier about my bookseller's faith in the power of reading. So let me share, before we go, a few sentences uh, on that subject from the introduction to my book by adding that this faith in reading's power and the learning and imagination it nourishes is something I've been lucky enough to take for granted as both fact and freedom. It's something I fear may be forgotten in the great amnesia of our in the moment news feeds and algorithmically defined identities which hide from our view the complexity of feelings and ideas that books demand we quietly and determinedly engage. To get lost in a book, be it a story or a study, is inherently to acknowledge the voice of another, to broaden one's perspective beyond the confines of one's own understanding. A good book is the opposite of a selfie. The right book at the right time can expand our lives in the way love does, making us more thoughtful, more generous, more brave, more alert to the world's wonders and more pained by its inequities, more wise, more kind. 
All those qualities are more important now than they've ever been, for they are the most enduring vaccination against the disease, both literal and figurative, that darkens our days right now. But let me close with some sunlight in the form of a poem that the sunshine of this beautiful July day, at least this morning, brought to mind. It's by the Irish poet Derek Mann. And while it may be wishful thinking, I've learned that especially in dark hours, providence prefers to be met halfway. Here's the poem. How should I not be glad to contemplate the clouds clearing beyond the dormer window and a high tide reflected on the ceiling? There will be dying, there will be dying, but there is no need to go into that. The poems flow from the hand unbidden and the hidden source is the watchful heart. The sun rises in spite of everything and the far cities are beautiful and bright. I lie here in a riot of sunlight, watching the day break and the clouds flying. Everything is going to be all right. That's Derek Mann. For my part, I'll add, be strong, be well, read good books, support your local bookstore, and I'll turn it back to Alice to tell you how. Thank Very you. Very hard to follow such eloquent, eloquent yes. wording. But I will say I am grateful for all of you to be here tonight, but most especially to Jim and Margo Mustick for bringing this so much fun, literary-based, enlightening event to our table and letting us do it three times. This has been a tremendous, tremendously special evening for me. I've learned about new books. Um, I've had a chance to see all of you, which has been a treat because we do get isolated and lonely here. Um, and I'm everywhere, frankly. But to talk about books with book lovers is a very special opportunity for us. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you to Jim and Margot. I have to tell you, A Thousand Books is one of the few books I don't mind spilling coffee on all the time because I'm constantly <laughs> looking at it. It is just such a great resource. It is such a great, wonderful book. If you don't own it, you need to get it because you will never ever have a better source for things that you've not had a chance to explore. So don't miss up the opportunity. I will send you a follow-up email tomorrow with all the links to all the fun we had tonight. So I, I am tremendously grateful and Steve and I thank each and every one of you from the bottom of our heart. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Alice. Thank you all. <laughs>